Thanks for coming in, Brian. I think one of the interesting things here is with the updates to the EPA rules, we're transitioning from a world where we we're largely looking at companies measuring emissions, you know, to know more, to do better. But now it's very quickly going to be a dollars and cents issue. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, especially with proposed subpart W and the IRA under the emissions fee, the methane fee. Um, very quickly, you can have an event, a single event that might cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars in 2024 when you start having to pay fees. God, I guess there's so many different moving pieces here. You have the other large release events. You have the super emitter response program. You have updates to Eldar under Quad OB. And then you have obviously revised factors and practices under subpart W. So I guess one of the biggest ones when we're looking at it, at least when we're talking about dollars and cents is the other large release events. And I guess just let's take a step back to unpack that and tell me where I messed this up. There's really two thresholds by which you'll have to report an other large release event. One, if you have any sort of leak that has a flux greater than 100 kilograms per hour, or if the cumulative emissions from an event are greater than 250 metric tons of CO2e. If either of those two are true, then it has to report as an other large release event. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. It's, it's important to note that the 100 kilograms an hour is methane. So it's not a CO2e. You don't have to do that calculation. It's methane itself. Um, but yeah, those numbers are correct. And they sound pretty high, but you take the example, and Dan Zimmerly put out a great LinkedIn post, right, about the 250 metric tons and how many days it might take at a given emission rate to exceed that. And if you're not looking frequently, you're gonna miss that opportunity potentially. And those fees, again, rack up extremely quickly. Yeah, so I guess before we go any further, these are just proposed rules, they're not final rules, just to caveat that, Yes. right? Uh, and so I guess dollars and cents, let's, let's try to unpack this a little bit more. I know we were chatting a little bit before we hopped on. If there's a very large release event, let's just say like 200 kilograms per hour, which is large, but compared to some of the stuff you see from satellites, like not necessarily extreme, um, if you were assumed, the, or I guess it is assumed that the event was occurring since your last LDAR inspection, is that correct? Uh, potentially, I think it depends on how you find it. So let's say you had an, an aerial or satellite uh, find that 200 kilogram release, you might have to go back to the last time that technology flew over that site to see if it was there at that given time. If there wasn't a time frame. Uh, where that satellite went over there, you might have to report back up to 182 days. Again, that's another proposed time frame, but half a year. So you, you might just have to assume that that event had been occurring for 182 days. So if you don't have information or very credible information to the contrary, yes. you know this this can expand pretty quickly. Meaning the time bound is pretty wide on that event. So at 200 kilograms per hour, then in this case we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of like 800,000 ish dollars at $900 per ton. And then, you know, escalating pretty quickly from there. Right. Yeah. I think by the time you get to $1,500 a ton, you're looking at $1.3 million around for one event. That's just one event. If it's picked up under those uh, numbers that we talked about, it's a significant amount of money. Of course, that assumes you're over the 0.2 methane intensity. Um, so we have to make that caveat yeah, as well. That's a very good caveat. Yeah. So you have to be subject to the fee. And Correct. then that is what the methane fee would. And we'll get into that in a second when we talk about subpart W. But I guess then let's talk about the alternative technology because continuous monitoring is just one. It was discussed in the preamble, if I remember correctly, but it wasn't actually specifically outlined. How should we think about that? Yeah, it, it wasn't very clear. Uh, it's pretty vague in the preamble on how they would allow operators to sort of time bound these events, right? So what will an operator be able to say or what data will be, they be able to provide to say, here's when it actually started. We're not going to go back 182 days. We saw it start last week. So the EPA will need to clarify, hopefully, in their final rule how operators can use that. But alternative technologies are certainly something that they should be looking for. If a continuous monitoring system, for example, can pick up when an event started, then they'll be able to time bound that. And you might have a significantly lower fee, of course. Say it's 24 hour event versus 182 days, might only be $5,000 for that particular event versus 800,000. So it could be a significant uh, change in what your financial um, fee might be. So a lot of times people are always talking about like ROI, right? For there, you would say like that's 160 Delta. And obviously like, you know, just every single day that the event is occurring for, you could have paid for continuous monitoring, you know, 
for a year or every few days, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to yeah. utilize as well. Yeah. But I guess given this is not necessarily defined, right? And it may be tied to some of the other stuff we'll t- discuss in a moment on Quad OB and Eldar. I guess it's important to try to go after probably quality measurements. Is that a fair point? Yeah, I think specifically for this, you want a measurement that's going to tell you exactly, uh, hopefully, when it started or at least shorten that time frame. So you want a system that's going to um, have high fidelity and be able to pick up even a small leak, especially if we're talking that 250 metric ton of CO2e. Those are That's to capture those leaks, right, that are smaller but last for a very long time. So you're going to want a type of system that can see those small leaks and be able to pick those up so you can address them long before you ever hit that 250 metric ton. Yeah, and that's another cool point as well. And and the interesting part is there's lots of technologies that check this box. There's some optical gas imaging stuff that that is already out or coming out. There's the point sensors, which obviously are dependent on the wind blowing it in the right direction. So obviously there's some squishiness there in terms of the time bound. It may take a day to, to get the wind going in the right direction. You have LIDAR technology. There's just a lot there. But I guess the other thing is speed is important, which you're touching on as well. So even if you were to like find it fairly quickly, right, um, you may be able to avoid the other large release event altogether. Right? Let's say it's like 20 kilograms per hour, and then you'll be able to avoid it altogether. Where if you found it with your quarterly flyover, your semi-annual flyover, you'll probably trip that 250 metric tons of CO2E. It's fair? Yeah, no, exactly. You're you're 100% correct. That 250 metric ton of CO2E. So again, you got to apply the global warming potential to the methane, uh, which is 25 times right now and it proposed to be higher. So you have to look at that over that period of time. So you're going to get there a lot more quickly uh, with a, a smaller release event that won't trigger for the 100 kilogram an hour of methane, but could easily trigger for the 250 metric tons. So the more quickly you see it and then respond to it and address it, the better chance you have of not having to report under subpart W for the other large release event. That's another twist. I guess I've always talked about it. There's still an assessment report four out of the UN, which is it's just old, old. Uh, and I think now we just had six, right? So they're there. So there's talk of updating that, which obviously would then compress that flux rate that would trip you for the same duration. Yeah, correct. Certainly for the, the CO2E. Jeez. Okay. So anyways, lots of benefits potentially to, to having more information for a variety of sorts, whether optical gas imaging, you know, more frequent LDAR inspections from a flyover, you know, point sensors, LIDAR on site, whatever it may be. But I guess let's then talk about the super emitter response program. So this is under Quad OB, obviously. So it's technically about controls in this case. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's an interesting one that came out in the proposal. Again, not final yet, um, although we're getting much, much closer. Um, That really addresses super emitter responses uh, for operators. So an approved technology, it's gonna be aerial, it's gonna be satellite most likely, it could also be mobile devices. Um, If it detects an event greater than 100 kilograms per hour, and it's an authorized company to do that, an authorized third party by the EPA or a regulatory agency, then that can get reported. One, the operator will get notified. Two, the EPA will get notified and that will go on an EPA website. Um, So there'll be public visibility to any of these events that exceed that 100 kilograms an hour. Um, And then it triggers a pretty quick response uh, from the operator as well. They need to have an initial root cause done within the first five days and start an action within 10 days to try and repair that. So these are pretty high emission events. And you notice I said 100 kilograms an hour as well. That ties directly to the other large release event. So it's also going to go under your subpart W report. So they're linked, even though they're you know slightly a little bit different. The SERP or supplemental response program, super emitter response program, sorry, um, is really addressed towards leak detection, right? So it falls under Quad OB, a new source performance standard to address those leaks and make sure they're captured or found and then re- repaired as quickly as possible. Makes sense. And I guess you mentioned companies and regulatory agencies. Would this also apply to nonprofits? Yeah, I think a nonprofit could as well if they had satellites or an aerial detection that could pick up uh, that kind of an event, then absolutely, as long as they are approved by the EPA to report that and they meet those standards, then yes, it could be a nonprofit as well. So what I'm hearing you say is all these super emitter response program emissions that are found will also be subject to other large release events. So there'll be dollars and cents tied to it. But in addition to that, you're going to appear on an uh, API website with every single one of these events listed. So you want to find it quickly, obviously, to lower your overall liability under the other large release events, but also to stay off that website. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, I think it's clear uh, if it's found 
by a technology that's not approved or found by yourself as an operator. Um, you don't have to report it up to the super emitter response program. You will still have to report it if it exceeds 100 kilograms an hour under your subpart W report, but you don't have to go through the super emitter response program specifically uh, if you found it yourself or with a, an unapproved uh, technology. So if, if those are the downsides, if, if those are the, the sticks, if you will, there, there's also some carrots, right? And I guess the one that comes to mind first is the Eldar changes in Quanto B, uh, in particular, allowing an easier path for alternative technologies of a variety of flavors. Again, they're not being prescriptive on the technology, which is excellent because there's many wonderful pieces of technology out there that can all address the, the same concerns. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so there's a couple pieces to it. There's uh, screening programs, which are periodic screening. Um, think aerial, satellite, again, uh, maybe drone technologies. Those, you can reduce your OGI camera inspection, which is going to be increased accordingly in most cases. Um, so you can reduce your OGI camera inspection frequency by using some of these other technologies. It kind of depends on detection level and how frequent and those kinds of things. So it's, it's a little bit complex to probably talk about today specifically. Um, but it's a great opportunity and those can help find those events. The other piece that the EPA put in the Quad OB is continuous monitoring. So they, they separated out those provisions a little bit and require an approved technology for continuous monitoring to be able to quantify site-wide emissions. So those trigger thresholds are based on site-wide emissions. And when you exceed either a seven-day rolling average or a 90-day rolling average, so a short-term or a long-term, then you have a response that you need to address to go find that leak and reduce those emissions again. So it's a little bit unique on continuous monitoring, but I think it's where EPA wants to go. It, again, it goes back to quantification, similar to super emitter response program. So part W, it's quantifying emissions. It's starting to go to allow those advanced technology to help quantify those emissions. So if an operator is using a technology that's approved under continuous monitoring, which again could, could be a variety of forms, that means that they won't have to run the prescriptive Eldar surveys semi-annually, uh, quarterly. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. As proposed, the OGI program essentially goes away. So you don't have recurring OGI programs on the facilities, which you're using an approved continuous monitoring device. Now, you're still probably going to use them, right, to go out if you find a leak and try and investigate that leak and pinpoint it, of course. So the the program doesn't necessarily go away, but certainly don't have to do quarterly or semi-annual or even annual inspections with OGI under the federal requirements for those rules. That's great, so a lot less windshield time and obviously there's there's costs associated with that as well. And I guess this brings us to like one of the last points that we'll talk about, this is the more nebulous one in many ways and that is subpart W. So to link it back to the other large release events, I very quickly uh, and rightfully said, hey, that is only if you're above the 0 0.2 methane intensity that these other large release events would subject you to paying a methane fee, right? And so. I guess there's a few things that we should unpack in that. First, if let's say you are at 0.08 methane intensity and you have one of those large release events that would then go into the, your emissions bucket, thereby potentially raising your emissions intensity to 0.09 in this fictitious example. So that's one. Two, if you are above that 0.2 and then you have that other large release event, well now all of a sudden you would be paying dollars on that specific event. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. You only pay on the amount above the 0.2 intensity. Again, speaking just for the upstream, there's some different numbers for different uh, parts of the value chain. But if we're just speaking of, of upstream, 0.2 is the threshold. So you only pay on that amount above. So if you're still below, even after reporting these other large release events, if you're still below that 0.2, you wouldn't be subject to any additional fee or any fee at all. And so I know independently, you and I have had some conversations with some folks in the space, some operators, and they said, well, hey, listen, I'm pretty far below 0 0.2. I don't think that these fees, you know, will be applicable to me. And again, this is, there's some folks out there who've run some analysis. We have not done this, but I know Enverse in particular has done some, some good analysis. And they were talking about 130% increase uh, when you start to account for things like, you know, engine slippage and the thief hatches and all sorts of stuff, including the, the um, other large release events. I guess, you know, you, you and I were talking, we just quickly did some back of the envelope math and it was like, it moved. If you have a 0 0.087, right? All of a sudden that would push you, assuming that 130% to a 0 0.2, right? So like, I guess the point is some of the operators may not have as much wiggle room as they previously have thought underneath of this, and so how, how should people be thinking about that and all these different pieces? 
Yeah, I think it'd be important for an operator to do their own evaluation on their specific uh, facilities and what they might be paying. But when the EPA came out with this proposed subpart W as part of the Inflation Reduction Act to add empirical data for reporting, um, there's some good changes, right? Some numbers went down, some numbers went up. But in total, as you mentioned, it looks like with all other things being equal, an operator's emissions are going to be higher than they were previously without making any changes whatsoever. So it's going to be pretty important for operators to really look at the detail of that. If they might think they're in a pretty good spot right now based on how subpart W reporting is today, but that might not be the case tomorrow if the new rule comes out as it's proposed. So it'll be pretty critical. 130% is a huge jump for no changes whatsoever. So those are numbers that need to be taken in, into consideration for each each company out there. And I guess this is where we get into the most perspective part of, of the conversation. Again, nothing has even been discussed at the you know regulatory level on this, but I guess there's some talk by operators to say, hey, these numbers seem very high. Can we use some form of measurement, whatever it may be, lots of wonderful forms of measurement to be able to put forward information to the contrary, i.e. showing that our emissions are quite a bit lower than some of these emission factors. I don't know how much you've had any of those discussions, but any thoughts on those? Yeah, I think it's a, an important conversation and one we've heard a lot of and one we're thinking about ourselves, right? Um, empirical data can mean actual data. And, and I think there's some opportunities for subpart W to be a little more explicit on what they will allow. Um, look, we're here in Colorado and Colorado is doing a lot, right? Driving towards measurement informed inventories and companies are spending lots of money to invest in these advanced technologies to help measure emissions and detect leaks and things like that. They should be able to take advantage of that. Um, and there's companies across the country doing the same thing, whether they're required by a state law or not. So they should be allowed to take advantage of those technologies that they're using to help reduce their emissions and push back on some of these numbers that might be set for a nationwide average, but don't necessarily apply to them either in the basin they operate or on how they manage their operations. Wow. So I guess there's so many pieces here. I'll try my best to thread this needle. Subpart W numbers are going up, which means that a company's more likely going to be exposed to an other large release event. It, it basically resulting in a fee, right? That they have to pay under the, under the methane fee rule. Then you have your super emitting response program. And so you will have an incentive to catch these events quickly so you can stay off the EPA website, just like you will have an incentive to find them quickly under the other large release event, because that will be less in the way of fines or fees that you have to pay. And oh, by the way, using some of this technology, we'll be able to give you the benefit of no longer running prescriptive LDAR surveys out to these well sites. Oh, and by the way, that same information may be able to be used, again, perspective may be able to be used as justification to the regulators to say, hey, some of these emission factors, at least as they apply to my sites or my facilities, not necessarily applicable. Yeah, that's the ideal situation, right? I mean, there's a lot of complications here, but to be able to tie these regulations together and have them harmonize and sort of speak to each other and be able to use data or information from one, to apply towards the other is where I think everybody would probably want to go rather than having all these different sets of books and different things you need to sort of keep track of. So the more they can harmonize and do that and thread that needle exactly like you said, I think is pretty key. Measurement, measurement, measurement. measurement. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Thank you.